meeting of the San Mateo County Harbor District Board of Commissioners <coughs> on October 4th um, at 706. Can we have a roll call, please? Commissioner Brennan. Here. Commissioner Bernardo. Here. Commissioner Chancarelli. Present. Commissioner Dush. Here. Commissioner Lorenz. Here. Okay, we have a quorum and we'll get to item B, the Oyster Point Marina and Park potential new agreement with South San Francisco. Steve McGraw. Thank you, commissioners and the public. I apologize for the technical difficulties. Uh, one of my uh, least favorite things to have happen. It always annoys me when it does. And I made every effort this afternoon to double check all of the connections, the wires, make sure I had everything in it. Went to the office and it didn't work yet. Does anybody have a pen that I could borrow? Sure. Great. Thank you. So the purpose of the meeting this evening then is to um, bring the commission up to speed and receive direction from the commission about the discussions that uh, staff have been having with uh, South San Francisco about uh, Oyster Point Marina and Park. Um, in the staff report, I'll, I'll go through the staff report first very briefly and then I'll walk through, unfortunately without the display, the slides in the presentation which, are, which you all have. Is there a way to have the camera be able to pick up the image so that the public, because we need the public to be able to see the same thing we're seeing? How could we do that? Is there a way to like shoot the, the presentation? It's on the website. <clears throat> we could shoot each um, individual page. I wonder if we could edit that in somehow after the fact when we get the video and see if we can. Is this PCTV? Here? Yes. Is that something you guys could add in? <laughs> Anything's possible. We'll figure so, it out. Can you just uh, hold the sheet up each time? Well, if it's sent to us. I will send you the PowerPoint and the slides. And then maybe you could interweave that into a final product. And then just charge we'll, us extra. And we'll figure it out. We'll figure out. Thank you. So most recently, the process of uh, renewing the uh, 1977 mm -hmm. agreement began in February 2017 when this commission directed staff to work with the city and the liaison committee on drafting a new agreement for operation of West Point Marina by the district. Uh, as we got into 2017 and the uh, development that was envisioned in the 2011 agreement uh, started coming to pass, we recognized that we needed to actually clean up some of the little misses on that 2011 agreement. And so by the time September 17 rolled around, we had what we termed an implementation agreement that clarified some of the issues related to that 2011 agreement and also address uh, the issue of the fueling infrastructure. That agreement in uh, 2017 um, stated that the, uh, in brief, that the uh, fueling infrastructure repairs and replacement would be funded by an addition to the previously planned uh, community facilities district that uh, uh, on formation of that community facilities district, which was add a levy on all properties within the district, uh, the uh, facilities district would fund in two phases the replacement of the entire uh, uh, fueling infrastructure, with the first phase being from the uh, water's edge out to the fuel dock and the dispensers. Uh, and the second phase, the underground lines back to the uh, underground storage tanks. Uh, that 2017 agreement also uh, imagined a scenario in which the community facilities district was not formed. And in that instance, the uh, district had the choice of either funding the fueling infrastructure itself or returning it, giving it back to the city. Uh, in which case the city would be take responsibility responsibility for decommissioning uh, that fueling infrastructure. Um, then in April of this year, the liaison committee met and 
reviewed a uh, draft term sheet that was uh, uh, tried to address some of the major issues uh, related to the potential new agreement. Um, this staff then came to this commission in, in July of this year with an update on several issues related to uh, the, the uh, Oyster Point, but we talked about the course of construction that was going on, we talked about the fueling infrastructure, uh, and we talked about the discussions that were ongoing with the city at that time uh, on a new agreement. We've been progressing in those discussions since then on trying to come to um, a more comprehensive term sheet and identifying all of the issues that we could identify and trying to put them into a format uh, ready to present to this board. Um, Steve, in the staff I, report, I, I have a question. Yeah. This revised staff report yes. that you're talking from yes. is not on our website. Debbie told me that she put it on our website with the links. Maybe somebody should check, but I'm on the website and I just clicked to it so I could click the links okay. and it's not could, there. Would you try refreshing the, the, sure. the browser? That was one of the things that she was doing this afternoon. Yeah, it's not. You can okay. see it. It's still not there. Um, see that? Yep. Yeah. Um, I just pull it up for the first time. So. From our website? Yeah. Okay. Here's where I got it from. Right here. Click the agenda. Ah, go back. <coughs> revised. Quick revised. Here we go. So um, the last page of the staff report mirrors largely the PowerPoint presentation. So if we go to that PowerPoint presentation, um, the first Steve, page. who developed the PowerPoint? Me. You designed this? Yes. There are templates. I can't take credit. Adobe or Microsoft has done a lot of the work already. Okay, so we're going to go through the Is presentation. Any? Let's just get through the presentation at this point. So, um, so again, as the, the PowerPoint says on, on the, the first page after the title page, discussions have been ongoing since uh, April. We updated the commission in July. Um, <coughs> trying to craft an agreement that's good for 35 years. We want to try to build in some certainty but flexibility to be able to reflect ch conditions that may change uh, as we move forward uh, and recognizing of course that everything at this point is always uh, as always subject to both uh, commission and city council approval uh, this first page the, the second the next page term uh, this was initially discussed as well in, uh, in Could, can April. I ask a question or do you yeah. want me to wait till the end and then ask the questions? Um, if it's a brief, discreet question, then we can quickly that, then let's keep those coming. Um, but if I haven't had time to go through the revised um, okay. staff report, so I don't know what all these links are yet. Okay. I mean, it's kind of hard to do that during the meeting. Um, however, I noticed that you've got reference to stuff in here, like for example, on page Two, which is really page one, I think, because the front is just a cover oh, page. First. You mean with the discussions page, page two heading? A number in the bottom right. Under yes. discussion. Yes. Um, it page says two. Uh, Slide two. ongoing since committee meeting, four seventeen. Do we do we have the minutes from that committee meeting? I know weren't weren't there court reporter minutes, or did the court reporter get? Canceled. The court reporter got canceled and it's action minutes uh, backed up by videotape. The committee has not met to approve minutes since that April Can meeting. So no minutes are approved? No. Through the chair, may, yeah. may the public make a comment please? Yeah, hold on for one second. 
Um, can right. you, when you get through this first slide, I'll take some public comment to. Okay, okay. Unless right. you're done with, are you done well, with this I mean, page? Because if know, you are. Actually, it's only uh, how many slides? We've got. I'm happy to 16, wait until 16 that. slides. How about I just go, go through and. Point of order, if I may, please. Okay. Please. Okay. Um, as a public member, I came here to listen to the presentation, thinking that the commissioners would be prepared, have done their own work, and they present the question after the presentation has been made. So, if it is all possible, Madam Chair, I'd like to ask you to allow the staff to make a report for us to understand that, and the commissioners may ask their questions after we are. Yeah. Okay, thank it's you. Possible. So noted. Thank you. So, okay, so Steve. So as, as uh, the committee initially discussed, we looked at a term. Uh, the term that staff recommending is would be an initial term of 15 years with two 10-year uh, renewals. Those renewals would happen uh, automatically unless uh, affirmative action to not renew was taken by either the City Council or the Harbor Commission, and that would have to occur at least two years prior to the uh, end of the term to allow for an orderly transition. We looked at the existing agreements, and uh, this would completely, any new agreement would completely replace the 1977 uh, Joint Powers Agreement but the, there is enough left in the 2011 MOU and in the 2017 implementation agreement that those would stay as a part of the new agreement until such time as they are of no more force and effect. We looked at uh, how we were going to move forward uh, and uh, everybody recognized that docs 12, 13, and 14 are past their useful life. The city's interested in seeing us move forward with replacement of uh, those docks. So we've got language in this that would say that we will make all reasonable efforts to do so by uh, the end of 2024. That as we approach the end of that period, that we would start looking at docks one through six, commission a study, present that study to the this commission, and uh, then take direction from that. If that did not result in a replacement of docks one through six, then we would uh, commission another study prior to the end of every one of the individual <coughs> term periods, the 15 years, the 10 years, the 10 years. Um, th these are all under obligations of the district. There's an obligation to the city section to come and an obligation to both sections as well. So the, the key part on both the city and the district is around operations and maintenance, which I'll abbreviate as O&M going forward, that uh, will uh, uh, O&M the uh, relevant parts of the Westland side. The Westland side is the area that will be primarily the responsibility either of private parties or the city, but there will be uh, restrooms in there uh, that are our responsibility. Um, that we will maintain the uh, Harbor Master Office and access to the office, that we will dredge, that we will consult with the city on leases and seek city approval if we're going to enter into any lease longer than 10 years or that extends beyond the term of the agreement. Um, and the, the district general manager and the city manager will cooperate on uh, efficient and cost-effective uh, O&M. Idea the, there being that if uh, there is, for example, uh, uh, green space in both areas of responsibility, that we don't have two landscape maintenance crews, we don't have two lawn mowers, we can have a cooperative agreement where one party takes responsibility and bills the other party for their uh, relevant portion of that. That we uh, agreed to develop open what we're calling operational performance indicators, OPIs. Basically ways to measure um, how we are doing. Are the bathrooms checked daily? Is the landscape maintained? Is the marina operating uh, efficiently and well? Is the pavement being maintained? Uh, the, the two 
metrics that we could come up with other than the landscaping shall be maintained appropriately. But the absolutes were that uh, in pavement condition, uh, which has been a source point, point over at Oyster Point, there is a way of measuring that. It's called the Pavement Condition Index, PCI. And the goal, uh, as an account trans standard, would be to maintain a PCI of 85, uh, and that either party would be in default if it dropped below 45. And for the uh, district, we would uh, strive to maintain an occupancy that was at least 80% of the mean of other Bay Area marinas. So if other Bay Area marinas are at 80% occupancy, we would be uh, looking to make sure that we were at least 64% occupancy, or 80% of that, uh, extenuating circumstances uh, not included. The city has obligations. The city's obligations to provide sewer, police, and fire to uh, operate and maintain the westland side. Uh, they're responsible for protecting against uh, sea level rise. The city is responsible for protecting against inundation caused by landfill subsidence and uh, responsible for corrective actions necessitated by that subsidence unless they're caused by the actions of the district. If, as part of that mitigation against sea level rise by raising the level of the spit out to the harbor master's office, there's language in there that says that uh, uh, we'll look together at the highest and best use of that building out there. That may be the harbor master's office, it may be a joint facility, or it may be that the city, having spent a significant sum of money to raise the elevation of the spit, feels that it's most appropriate for uh, city public uses in which case the city, uh, at their sole expense, would be responsible for finding us um, uh, equivalent or, or alternative suitable space to uh, have a harbor master's office. Now I'm on to slide nine, uh, obligations of both parties. Uh, the district general manager and the city manager will meet regularly and prepare an annual report. The, City manager and district general manager will manage compliance with the OPIs, those operational performance indicators that I mentioned earlier, and will uh, work cooperatively on sharing maintenance when it's more efficient or cost effective to do so. Water quality um, the district uh, will be responsible in the marina for making sure that its tenants. Uh, don't empty uh, dirty bilge water or have fuel leaks into the water. Um, but otherwise, especially when it comes to leachate, stormwater, groundwater, uh, that's the city's responsibility. Slide 10, governance. Um, we're suggesting that the city and the district each establish a two-person committee and that those uh, committees meet together at least annually and with the goal of at least, uh, and at minimum, receiving the annual report mentioned earlier that will be prepared by the city manager and the district general manager. There will be a mutual uh, indemnification, of course, and the city also indemnifying the district for sea level rise and, and subsidence. Recognizing that um, the whole area is in somewhat a state of turmoil uh, right now as the uh, work envisioned in the 2011 agreement is progressing. We recognize that the first thing when the literal and figurative dust settles is that we should um, uh, have a proper survey that will allow us to accurately and exactly measure who's responsible for what. Uh, as you approach a dock landing, um, at what point might it transition from city responsibility to district responsibility, for example. We want to make sure that we don't have uh, confusion around that with both parties pointing at each other saying, I thought you were doing it. Slide 11, the um, annual report will address compliance with the operational performance indicators, the OPIs. 
Until such time as the issue is resolved, we'll be looking at the budget for the fuel and, and progress on the fueling infrastructure, any other marina planning that might be taking place, um, district financial reports as related to OPM, and the district capital asset schedule. And I'll explain in a minute why that is uh, significant and important. Actually, it's coming right up. Next slide, slide 12, termination. What happens when the uh, agreement terminates? And um, uh, we went into this thing. This would be uh, difficult to resolve. The details are still yet to be resolved, but I think we've got some clear understanding of some of the basic principles about how to terminate this agreement. As I mentioned at the beginning, the term is Im imagined as a uh, 15 year, initial 15 year with two 10 year options. And either party may uh, terminate the agreement uh, by giving notice to the other party at least two years prior to the end of each of those terms. Um, the district could terminate the agreement another time if the city's in breach of its ag the agreement, if the city's uh, through the city's failure to substantially meet the operational performance indicators. Uh, but the city wouldn't be in default if the matters were something out of its control. And if we're uh, terminating under those circumstances, as opposed to just a simple non-renewal, uh, there would be a, at least a one-year notice or less if mutually agreeable. The city could similarly terminate the agreement if we're in breach of the agreement, if we fail to substantially meet the OPIs, if we just simply fail to operate the marina if we, for 30 days, if we, if we don't send any staff over there, if we don't do anything. Uh, we're not in default again if the matters are outside of our control and again with the same term, a year less if mutually agreeable. <coughs> Slide 14, on termination, what happens to the stuff? What happens to our investments that we've made into the facilities? And this is certainly complex with, a lot, with some details needing to be resolved. Um, in either instance, uh, the simple part is that uh, we keep the personal property. Uh, personal property in this instance is anything re easily removable. Our vehicles, our vessels, our equipment, all of that uh, belongs to the district and goes with the district. If it's a um, uh, non-renewal uh, in one of those term instances, uh, we all agree that this idea is to ensure that the district is motivated to invest in the facilities. And as we saw in an earlier Dornbush report, we found that a 30-year term was a suitable term to recoup investment in docks. And that is, in fact, how we depreciate our docks is over a 30-year term and we keep a fixed asset schedule that shows what we paid for something, how long we've had it, and what its current book value is. So the basic principle here uh, is that on termination, we would determine the current book value of our assets, and the city would pay us that book value for those assets on the depreciation schedule that is established in our fixed asset schedule. Uh, so to put an example on that, we spend a million dollars on a dock that has a useful life of 30 years. After 15 years, it's worth $500,000. That we would continue to depreciate over the next 15 years at about $33,000 a year. If we end up walking away from that dock with a book value of $500,000, uh, the city would pay us on that depreciation schedule the $33,000 a year for the remaining life of the dock. If the dock is 30 years old, it has no, depre no uh, book value left. We have fully depreciated it and have uh, realized the return on the investment through birth rentals, and that would have no value and we would uh, walk away from that. But all other assets, we would um, 
uh, be compensated at book value in a schedule that aligns with our depreciation schedule. If the city finds us in default, then for let's take that extreme example. We have decided we don't want to run a marina anymore, and we just stop sending staff over there, and we just don't operate it. Okay, the city's position on that is that they shouldn't be forced into uh, having to do that. They have to gear up. We have to uh, uh, somehow or another uh, compensate them for that assumption of an obligation that they did not want to assume, um, and that we have uh, forced their hand through our uh, detrimental activities. That's a part of this that we haven't uh, come to yet. It might be that we look at something like if we have a budget for uh, operations and maintenance and we haven't been spending that budget, is that a is, is there a, a, a means there of transferring some funds to the district, to the city? Uh, is there a means wherein we could assign a percentage value of the book value to uh, an asset if we have not been uh, doing our maintenance obligations or we have simply operated, uh, stopped operating the marina? So I think that there's um, and then there's also uh, the possibility that um, we could say, the city could say, uh, we don't want a marina anymore. Uh, you guys don't know how to run a marina. We don't want to run a marina. Uh, take your docks and go home. And we would, in that instance, it would be uh, complex, difficult, and expensive. But uh, along with all our other personal property, the trucks, the vehicles, the vessels, the equipment, we would and basically unbolt and float away our docks and uh, uh, figure out what that looked like from there. Uh, again, this is the part that is complex, but the as long as um, the termination is a, an agreeable one in which the district has not been uh, uh, in default, then we have the fundamentals of an orderly transition uh, to uh, to a post Harbor District Oyster Point Marina. <coughs> the details surrounding them on uh, slide 15. The details surrounding uh, just how the water quality issues that I've addressed in full brushstrokes uh, need to be determined. Uh, I think we haven't quite finished plumbing the depths of. Uh, landfill subsidence and responsibilities there, uh, nor have we finished quite plumbing the debts of termination and the disposition of assets. There is, uh, much like in the existing JPA, there is a, uh, we would anticipate a clause that talks about cooperation on termination, that we will cooperate on uh, an orderly transition for our tenants, our uh, leaseholders, and our staff. These, are, again, are things that we continue to work on and work on aggressively. Uh, so the next steps are to incorporate any board input to, into this draft agreement to continue our refining our discussions with the city uh, and to uh, come back to this board and uh, separately the city council for uh, further discussion and possible action. So with that, um, that is the staff report. I think that um, I do want to, uh, at this point though, also uh, thank very much John Moore, uh, who's been um, uh, present in all of our meetings and has been valuable <coughs> counsel and input. Um, and then uh, Mike Futrell and Marion Lee, the assi assistant city manager. And then also district counsel, uh, Steve Miller and city attorney, Jason Rosenberg. I think that the tenor of the meetings has been collaborative and cooperative, and I think that because of that, we've got the makings 
of a mutually beneficial agreement that could serve the district and the public well for the next to potentially 35 years. So again, with that, I haven't answered any questions. Okay, so um, I'm going to open up public comment before I take commissioner questions and discussion. <coughs> so is there anyone from the public who would like to speak? And I'll keep it open until after um, the commission has a chance to discuss so that people can add comments after we have our discussion. So any public comment? Okay, then I'll open it up for commissioner questions and discussion. Tom? <coughs> Steve, you mentioned, uh, let's say that things fell apart and we had decided to abandon the project. It seems to me that with the meetings of the liaison group that nothing as sudden as this could ever happen and that would be a great time if there was even some friction to say, well, perhaps we could enter into some cross training and prepare some uh, city personnel or park personnel or hire some people, uh, I think that that would be an easy uh, option for if there was an abandonment, although I don't foresee it because I think that uh, the whole project here, the work you've put into it, the planning that's gone into this, <coughs> uh, to me this is very well done. Thank you. Certainly if there was a sudden break, like we suddenly stop sending people over there, uh, stop sending staff over there, that's one thing, the, the non-renewal on term, you recall, uh, requires action by either body two years prior. And then even with default, we've got a one-year period. So the hope there was that under either amicable parting or a default parting, that there would be plenty of time to uh, uh, either bring in another <coughs> outside operator or, as you suggest, cross-train um, staff. And if I could just jump in, the meetings that I've been part of, there's been uh, a, a total commitment to a principle that a sudden disruptive end is not contemplated and that any kind of, uh, there, there's a process in place for dispute resolution and a plan for curing if one party thinks the other party isn't doing their job right and an escalation ladder, uh, the, the sudden scenario that was just described, I think. Uh, almost contractually just could not happen. Avoid. Precisely. Yeah. Sabrina, Robert, do you have any questions? I, I just wanted to say, um, well, first of all, thank you for this presentation. I really like the way you made it so simple to understand with the bullets. Because um, we're dealing with a lot of um, complex issues here. Um, so I just want to say thank you for that. and. Um, it was more than six slides, though. I know you right. Six slides. <laughs> six yeah, it's, it was a little long, but it still, I thought, was um, easy to understand and easy to follow. Okay? Um, so I just wanted to say thank you for that, and um, I'm totally in support of this. Sabrina, do you have any questions or comments? Um, yeah, I do. Okay. Um, so what was the, who was the, the um, contractor who helped us with the financial analysis um, <coughs> previously regarding Oyster Point. Dornbush? You mean the Dornbush report? Yeah, Dornbush. Um, can we make sure that that's linked to this agenda so it's easy for me to find it? Um, I can ask Debbie to do that. On our website, I think if you look, come down under Oyster Point, you also find pretty much everything that we've done is, is there under that place to point pull down. But. Um, so one of the things about that report was it made it clear that um, this was not a financially good deal for the district. And I think we need to look really closely at that report. So I'd like to be able to go over that at a future meeting. Um, I think we haven't looked at it in a while and we spent a lot of money getting that report done and it made some um, important, um, provided some important information that I think the board should be reminded of with regard to um, the financial situation. And, and there hasn't been financial analysis provided to us in this information in any depth whatsoever. And so we would certainly need detailed financial information about 
what kind of profit the district would be able to make, um, you know, to put towards the services that we offer with our staff and, you know, this is indicating that we're going to be taking on all kinds of CIP projects, none of which we would own because we don't own the land. So there needs to be a, comp um, a comprehensive financial analysis as to whether or not this is financially a good viable deal and if it's good for the rate payers. Um, and none of that's been provided so far. So is that something we can get? Soon? Well, I'd have to say that in November 2017, when the board looked at the Dornbush report, uh, we did look at a lot of these issues. Uh, and I think the final uh, outcome of that Dornbush report was that uh, That, that, as I said earlier, that a, uh, any new agreement should be a 30-year term uh, in order to recover our costs and uh, on any capital investments. And I think what the Dornbush report did not anticipate, which I think is uh, actually a significant breakthrough in this report, in, in this proposed uh, agreement, is that even if we are not there for the full 30 years, uh, depreciated value of the, uh, to depreciate down to zero any uh, capital improvements, that the remaining book value of those improvements would be paid to us by the city on the termination of the agreement. I, I agree that that's an important point <coughs> to make, um, but again, we're talking about a report that we haven't been provided with, so it's not, yeah. we need to well, look at it. Yeah. Okay, but so I'm just we, asking. We, we, can, we, we can do that, certainly, if that's the will of the commission. And I think um, we need to we, see a financial analysis yeah. so we can yeah. see at what year, is this some kind of a break even, or is this a money loser, and how much, how, how full does the marina have to be to pay for all these docks, and what are the docks projected to cost? I think, I think that's all in the Dornbush report. Well, yeah. then we should be presented with that, because that was how many months ago? Uh, we did that in uh, uh, November of 2017. Okay, so that was like... Less than a year. Quite some time ago, and so I think if we're gonna be looking at this comprehensively, we've got to look at that report again. Uh, we can't be making decisions without uh, proper financial data to make our decisions on. I mean, I need a basis for understanding what the fiscal implications to the public and the district will be, and I want to know what the cost-benefit analysis is, and we need to see a cost-benefit analysis, because this is not the same scenario that we looked at in the Dornbush report. It may be that this is a better scenario, in which case we should see that shown to us so that it's clear how it is a better scenario and so the public can see the numbers as well and understand how this would benefit the district and I think we have to make sure that we're clear about the loss in lease revenue I mean we are not getting any revenue to speak of at Oyster Point any longer with the exception of slip fees and how does our staffing costs and our CIP costs and all of the money that we pump into the facility balance out when, you know, is it break even? Is it losing money? You know, and how does that impact our ability to do CIP projects at the facility that we own? So well, I think. That's actually one of the benefits of, of what we started doing mm -hmm. when we started breaking out our budget into enterprise and uh, public and revenues. Yeah. And uh, in our 18 19 budget, we see that the uh, operating revenue exceeds operating expenses at both Oyster Point well, let's and just, Point. Let's look at it with the scenario that you're proposing here. You know, let's see that with this scenario. This is a specific scenario. Let's look at how the numbers work out in this scenario. I don't think that's too much to ask to look at that because what's being proposed here is that we are considering an agreement to do <coughs> capital improvement projects um, and staff and pay for things like electricity and water and all of that at a facility that the district doesn't own. <coughs> and that in itself is a very unusual situation for a public agency to take on, you know, investing in someone else's um, property. And, you know, I don't, I can't think of any other special district doing that. So that is a very unusual situation 
and one that we need to be fully informed about, you know, why that's a good idea. Um, I think there are a lot of questions about whether that's a good idea or not. I mean, maybe the money would be better spent um, funding projects at a, 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 a number of different facilities, such as the Brisbane Marina or the Redwood City Harbor, or, you know, maybe we should be looking at funding things consistently throughout the county versus, you know, funding a facility and putting CIP projects into a facility that we don't own and we can't take them out of. Um, you know, it, it, that doesn't make sense. And, you know, doing things like repairing asphalt or whatever the CIP project is, normally, you know, you don't spend money on CIP projects at a facility that you don't own. You know, the taxpayers could see that as corruption and a fraudulent type of decision making if we can't explain to them how this is in their best interest. I, I really can't uh, see, Commissioner Brennan, how you can make a leap towards uh, using a term like well, it's it's the tax. But, I mean, I think that it's you know, the taxpayers' money. Can I, can I, like, but we don't like hear the back general and forth. I I'm would not like done. to hear the general manager's. I'm not done. But I think he has the right to respond. Perspective. I mean, it could be that one could consider, could consider this as a zero cost ground lease, mm -hmm. and you know, a ground lease is a fairly common occurrence where somebody will lease a piece of ground and build a facility on it with the idea that they will get a return on that investment over time. In those instances, oftentimes the, you have to pay for the ground lease. We're not paying for a, a ground lease here. But it's, a, it's just another, I haven't thought that through. It's just another way of thinking. Well, let me things. turn it around for you. Another scenario would be a management agreement where the city paid us to manage the property for them because they don't do, as they've told us, they don't manage right. marinas. They don't have experience doing it. So what we had asked for previously during the Dornbush days was a alternative to this, which is looking at essentially charging the city for the services that we're providing. And that is not an unusual situation either. That's a common situation. And asking the city to pay for the CIP projects that are improving the property that they own. So, you know, you could look at it either way. I think, uh, I think, true. I think that's the true. taxpayers I mean, I think would want us to look at it that way because, you know, 50% of our revenue is coming from countywide taxpayers. And, you know, again, that gets back to the cost benefit analysis. How do we show the benefit? And maybe there is a benefit to countywide taxpayers for this investment. I don't know, but we need to show a clear cost benefit analysis and how <coughs> this investment is, is somehow going to benefit countywide taxpayers in a way that makes it makes financial sense. And I don't have the numbers in front of me to be able to look at any of that. So those are all things that I'd like to understand in depth. I'd like to understand the math. And if that means that I need to come into the office and do that, I'm happy to do that. Um, I also have a number of questions about the presentation, um, so I'd like to ask those questions okay. Go ahead. if this is the chance yeah. to yeah, do this it. this is the time. Um, so let's see here. Uh, I think there's a number of additional documents, such as the Dornbush report, that we need to have added, and I'll try to mention those as I think of them links just so that it's easy for us to find stuff when we're clicking through this because um, I, I just don't have the time right now to search our archives yeah, I, um, again it's on the pull down tab what's the point on. it'd just be nice if it was you know since it's it's hey. incredibly Lack relevant from to this excuse me uh, this is my turn thank you um, so with regard to the 15 years, I know previously, last time I heard, I think the number 45 years was thrown out there and the city council balked at that and was like, if you think it's gonna take 45 years for return on investment, then you're, you're, you shouldn't even be looking at this. Um, you know, one thing that concerns me about the docs, so is, I guess what I'd like is a list of all the CIP projects that were expected to pay for and I heard you name a few things but I think we need a comprehensive list of all the CIP projects that 
are included in this agreement that you're proposing for the next 15 years? Like, what are they? You know, we ought to be able to project. We've been running that marina long enough to ha have a pretty good idea. So that would be... Um, the, the only facilities that we've specifically called out in this agreement so far are in two parts, blocks 12 through 14, and then subsequently blocks 1 through 6. What about restroom replacements and things like that that come up and, and we, pavement? And we, haven't called those out specifically. What we are saying is that there are operational performance indicators that will address maintenance on those facilities. Well, when you say yes, I heard, I read that um, the OPIs. That is a very vague term, and I want to know the specifics of exactly what the OPIs are, yes. because that just We're could mean anything. Under development. Yep. Okay, so we need details. Yes, and and absolutely, as I said, this will come back a completely fleshed out form. I but I think you can then pick apart I think the level we need, of detail. I think we also need to look at an alternative where the city pays us to manage the marina and they pay for CIP projects. And that way it's they could you know, there doesn't need to be a fifteen year agreement. It could be like a five-year agreement or it could be a, a you know year-to-year -year agreement and they could cut us loose anytime they wanted. The city has made it abundantly clear they have zero interest in uh, assuming any responsibility for capital projects. Um, zero. So that was proposed? Yes. So a, a plan where they would pay us to manage the marina? We have had a conversation about a management contract as you describe it where they would simply pay us a fee and assume more responsibility for capital projects, and that's a non-starter. Ken, was that proposed in a written agreement? So no, they could draft? It was part of our conversations. Just all verbal yes. conversations? Part I, of the negotiation process? Yes. So I'm a little uncomfortable with how much has been happening without any direction from the board, and board direction wasn't, we weren't even updated that, that, that they turned that down. Well, I'm sorry that you weren't present at the July meeting when I yep. last gave a comprehensive update. I the watched the video, Steve. Okay. You didn't mention that they had turned down that request. I, um, we've got many, many hours of conversation and discussion. Well, that's a pretty big deal that you, you tried to negotiate for that. You tried to negotiate for a management agreement where they pay us to manage their facility and they pay for CIP projects that improve their own facility that they own and they turn that down. That's a pretty big deal that I would have wanted to know. Now you know. Okay, well, now I know. Okay, well, good to know now, I guess. Um, so, with regard to district responsibilities for Marina and East Side, um, of course the question comes up of the development schedule that I've been asking for for over a year, and so far what I've been told by the developer is that the development project is really far out in the future and that there's no plan to build anything right now. That's completely contradictory to everything I've heard. They're going to finish this phase of the... Uh, uh, I'm not talking about the road. I'm talking about the building. I'm, the, my understanding from Kilroy is they're going vertical as soon as they get done with the work that they're doing now. Then why haven't they provided us with a development schedule? And I asked for it as recent as maybe a month or so ago when I talked to the developer. John is in, our, is in regular meetings with Kilroy and the city uh, and the contractor and... Uh, John, do you have a development schedule? No, most of the conversations I've had with them uh, have been with regard to the uh, construction that's taking place at present out there and how it impacts our, uh, our tenants. Have they told you that they, what date they plan to start construction on the buildings, not the road? I understand that's part of the recapping of the landfill, but when is the construction on the buildings going to occur? I don't have that date with me, but I do recall a um, conversation where they said they did indicate they were going to go vertical as soon as they were done with the, uh, with like the eight, eight, elevation. 12 to 18 issues. months? Does that sound about right? I, my understanding was that they, they were going to go vertical. Uh, with at least one of the buildings what, there. Like the hotel or what are they? Not the hotel. The, the hotel is going to be done by the city, is my understanding. But the, the actual office building, because they're already talking about how um, uh, how some of the, uh, the road issues might impact the, uh, the last the time I talked the to, to the developer, which was not that long ago, they told me that you know it could be 10 years or more before they do it. 
So could we, if that's not correct, if that's changed, and maybe the person I was talking to didn't know what they were talking about, but everybody knows how these things work. There's a construction schedule, and if this is something that's supposed to happen in the near future, then certainly they have a construction schedule. I've been asking for that for over a year now and have not seen anything. So can we get the construction schedule, please, so that we can see what is really happening if this is just going to be a recap landfill with the new road, which is what Mark Adiago just told me the other day in person, or if there's actually something more to this project that's really on the table, or if this is just some you know, vagueness out in the future. I, th I think the project will happen someday, but we need to base decisions off of what the construction schedule actually is. And if it doesn't, if they don't have any hard data and there's no actual plans yet, and they don't have the financing in place and they don't have the you know groundbreaking date set and they don't have the plans, you know, are the plans approved? I mean, what's going on with planning? All that information, public record, we should be able to get all of it. If we don't know what that is, we just have no clue about you know what's going on with this land and if if there isn't a development project happening soon then you know keeping that marina full is going to be continue to be problematic and there are issues we need to consider we also need to consider what the impacts of the development are based on the schedule and how is that going to affect us and our ability to to lease out space if there's a huge development project being built and nobody wants to have their boat in the way of um, all kinds of you know construction going on which creates dust and creates noise reaps havoc it doesn't exactly create a pristine marina environment so these are all you know data points that we need to consider and understand <coughs> so I think you know it's it's really it just bizarre to me that this construction schedule is still not available so I hope we can track that down um, and better understand that. And then with regard to, um, let's see, city responsible for sea level rise protection. Um, you know, the news about sea level rise keeps getting worse and worse. Have we checked in to see, you know, if there's any new information about raising the height of the land and how that's gonna impact projects um, what is the deal with you know how much fill is going to have to be brought in where's the fill going to be located can we get some specifics it's probably time to get a new presentation from the developer frankly because it's not even the same developer as the last time we got a presentation so I would just say uh, you know presentation from developer is something that I want to see and I think I think that the public would want to see that too, especially people that have their boats um, at Oyster Point. I think a presentation from the developer where they can, and they need to bring in writing the construction schedule. You know, it's got to be in writing on a like spreadsheet or however they want, that's how they're normally done is on a spreadsheet and you see all the dates and then you see the various things they plan to do on such and such date. I mean, that's the kind of information. I think you know, John, what I'm talking about. Um, so presentation from the developer, development schedule. Um, as far as like sea level rise goes, we need an update from the city and the developer on you know what what's going on with that. You know how much fill is being brought in. Where is the fill going to be located? Does it affect the property that we would be managing at all? It may not. In which case, it would be nice to be clear that the fill isn't going on the property that we're responsible for. Because if there are problems with um, inundation, those may become costly problems for the district and it could result in a lawsuit, you know, based on the way this agreement may be drafted. Um, so those are things I want to understand. And as far as the landfill subsidence, I'm very concerned about this clause here that says, unless caused by district. What does that mean? How could we possibly cause landfill subsidence that's been happening since the 1970s? What does that mean? Oh, oh all right. Um, it's, 
what, what, um, the idea is um, that if there is damage to something that we have done, um, let's see, <coughs> if the city's primary, the city is primary is responsible for landfill subsidence. Any damage caused by landfill subsidence, unless that landfill, unless that damage is caused by something that we have done or not done. So, for example, we build a new building. The landfill subsides and causes damage to that building. Then it would, uh, I think, an argument could be made that our engineer was at fault in not designing the right uh, foundations, and uh, we would not be uh, able to go back to the city for that damage to our building. We are not responsible for the damage of the landfill subsidence itself. A good example of that is out at the end of the spit where the Harbor Master's office is, where we did design an appropriate foundation when we built that building, and that building has stayed exactly where we put it, and it's the landfill that has subsided away from it. So um, I think what we're trying to do is ensure that the city is primarily responsible for landfill subsidence but that if damage to our uh, improvements occurs uh, uh, and is sort of exacerbated by actions that we have taken, then we cannot go back to the city on that. It's sounding like the Millennium Tower, like a lawsuit. So I think this is an area that really needs to look yes. to yeah. very, very close consideration, yeah. and, the, and the board needs to understand what communication has been going on here about this, because in my mind, there is no circumstance where we should be considered at fault for landfill subsidence. We're not the ones that built the landfill. Not for the landfill subsidence, but for damage to our facilities. By landfill subsidence? Yes. If well, we haven't designed it properly, then we are, we can't assign them that responsibility to the district, to the city. So if, if our, what facility are we talking about here? We're trying to like uh, a road, or what do we? What roads do we, are roads are particularly challenging because it's. I don't think it's possible to design a road that will stay exactly where it is if the land underneath it is subsiding, unlike a building. Um, well, let's just first of all let's just be clear here, so everybody knows the land is subsiding at Oyster Point Marina. The land is sinking because it's a landfill and there is landfill subsidence documented and it's pretty alarming. Um, so, of course, I agree there's gonna be damage to roads. How could there not be? Well, uh, and I think one of the things that we're struggling with is the what it means, uh, what damage means. And uh, we would not like to see um, uh, damage occur if that damage could be prevented by a regular program of sealing uh, and resealing a road, for example. We know that asphalt develops cracks, cracks allow penetration of water, that can lead to further deterioration. Uh, and in an instance like this, it could lead uh, or exacerbate landfill subsidence. We want to make sure that we uh, maintain our facilities properly so that no issues with landfill subsidence <coughs> are exacerbated. That seems like a really slippery slope and a gray area where we could end up on the end of a, a you know lawsuit that costs the district a lot of money. Why I worry about that, well, we don't want a lawsuit, number one. Number two, the city has very deep pockets compared to the district. The city has a huge budget and the city, you know, has a lot of money coming and going. Uh, we are a relatively small special district. We, our budget, what's the city's budget? Do you know? I don't know. Somebody here, you must know. I haven't been following their, their so budget process. <coughs> there, I don't think it's right. We can look it up online. I don't, I don't think, I mean, the budget gets huge. relevant. They are, they are yeah. a bigger public entity than we are. Yes. Yeah, it's it's but huge. most most cities are bigger than we are. Most organizations. So I don't really. The point is that we don't want to get into a lawsuit with the city. No. That's I, my point. And I think that point is well made. And uh, and I think your general counsel here has been uh, 
fierce in the discussions and trying to make sure that we are adequately protected from situations that it's actually, to be quite honest, quite difficult to imagine that may occur 30 years down the road. So the thing about landfill subsidence is it is exasperated or it's, it's increased by sea level rise. And you've got external factors that are completely outside of our control. If somebody wanted to make the argument that we were causing, you know, the subside or causing the damage because we somehow didn't build properly, but the fact of the matter was the subsidence was happening and it was creating damage. I just don't see it. that could get into a really difficult thing in court that could end up, you know, taking a very long time to sort out and it could it, even if even if the whole thing failed, if the city sued us and you know, they couldn't prove that it was our fault, the cost and legal fees alone right. just to have that right. going on right. would be substantial for this district. I understand well the cost of legal fees. I think the fundamental premise in this agreement control, yeah. uh, with uh, layers of context on top of it, but the fundamental concept in this agreement is that the city <coughs> is responsible for protecting against sea level rise and the city is responsible for landfill subsidence. And there are nuances to that, but that's the underlying precept. Unless, cause, unless caused by district. That's I try to explain that, that, that there is a nuance there. That if we have done something, and I can't imagine what it would be, but if we have done something that has exacerbated a situation, then we should own that. But if we haven't done anything, then the underlying precept again is that it is the city's responsibility to manage landfill subsidence and protect against sea level rise. Well, so I, Sabrina, hold on, because I want to give Ed and Tom a chance to, then we can that's circle fine. back. I'm okay. happy. Then. Okay, Ed. Okay. My first question is: I looked at the Dorn Bush report, and when we had the discussions with Dorn Bush both with the Finance Committee that you and I were on and after. One thing that we asked for we never did get was an, um, a request that they look and study alternatives like you were saying, just based on, on input from the voters of San Mateo County, not just South San Francisco. We had asked that that would be a good comparison between what the city was proposing and and what we could possibly do. So that was that never happened. It, I'm not sure we can get it, but it would, would be useful to do that. But more importantly, what would be useful? Oh, well, when, when we asked for Doran Bush to do this work, we requested that they also look at alternatives. The, like and the management agreement? No, 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 the, the financials. Doran Bush did a... They had three, basically, if I remember correctly, three different options. So, the, okay, I'm, I'm, I don't mean to interrupt, I'm yeah. just trying to clarify in my mind. The financial agreement. Yeah. You know, like yeah. looking at, at an overview yeah. of, of what mm -hmm. was being proposed. So they did, a, they did a pretty nice job with that. Mm -hmm. But what they didn't do, and it was not their charter because we didn't ask them to do this, we request, as a committee we were talking about it, but in, the board never asked. And that was to look at alternatives with respect to what what the voters of San Mateo County might want. Mm. Okay, it's I a don't different think that question. ever came up to the board level, did it? Right. Well, we it, talked about it at the board level. But we never I requested them to do it. at all, but okay. So that, that that's just a, a historical team. fact. Yeah. Okay. That so, actually came up a lot in board yeah, meetings. Yeah, we never got that. But what's more important I now, I that. think, is how does the Doran Bush report that we did get, how does that align with the plan that we're all talking about here. And I I guess I should have asked this question first is how do we know what what we're discussing here because I don't I don't have is there a draft agreement that you guys have been working on that's accessible on our website? I mean no. the <coughs> your this presentation while it was nice that it had bullets on all the different topics it seems to me that most of those topics could be a meeting in and of themselves, and it would be, as a member of the public suggested, you know, we'd like to come to a meeting like this prepared 
but we can't if we don't know the details and it's the details that are important. And so what would be useful maybe at another meeting is to, to have the details of what we have in these bullets compared to what we, the financial information that came out of that Dorn Bush report and see if for us to get a feel for the premise of that, all the different premises in that report that led to the financial analysis, how that, re how those premises relate to what, we're, what you're actually planning. Do they align or are they significantly different? If they're significantly different, then we should ask them to review it. Because how are we, go as an organization, going to make a, um, an informed decision about something that's going to last for quite a while without having that financial comparison. I mean, that's why we asked the, for the report in the first place. But now we need to know, I know I'm repeating myself, but mm -hmm. I just want to make it clear that those two, two things are aligned. If they're not, how are they not, and what's the impact? I mean, maybe it's okay. better. Good. Good. Yeah, the next time this comes back to the Commission, I would hope that we would be in a position to present you with a draft agreement, and certainly we could look at it. It would be really helpful to have well, that agreement. Yeah, this is just to discuss and give direction. Right. So if this is part of the direction you want right. to give, that's fine. Yeah. So it'll it'll come back to us. But we weren't going to vote on anything today. No, no, I understand. But I, it, it's hard to give direction other than I'd like to have more detail so I could actually so think about this. And, yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Okay. I think that's okay. clear. Tom. Oh, do you have any more questions? No. Okay, Tom. You know, right now we have an MOU between the Arbor District and the city that we're operating under successfully. There's been a groundbreaking, and that took place, I'm not sure if it was a year ago or what, uh, but that was publicly noticed and a large number of people, a large number of uh, elected officials throughout the county attended that. There's construction underway right now, and it'd be difficult to to recognize anything that's going on. So this project is underway and doing well. I'm hearing some of the same things that we're trying to obstruct this project moving forward. <clears throat> and what we have is a group, San Mateo County Harbor District, that manages harbors and marinas. And that's what we're being asked to do again. And <clears throat> I would just like I, I'm, I'm puzzled. I'm puzzled. I'm shocked that there's this much discussion over old things that have been brought up years ago that we've worked through and we've had presentations at board meetings on our progress of the liaison committee. We've talked about these things. We've had presentations. <clears throat> Construction's going on and all I would advise is you're doing an excellent job right now. Continue. There's very few sticking points left. <clears throat> and this is not something we're going to abandon or change right now. We're talking about the, uh, whether you call it landfill, climate change, everything. All these things are being worked on right now. So what more do we need? We can't suddenly say, stop, let's do the whole thing over again. The whole thing's underway. We're, we're doing well at this moment. Yeah, <clears throat> just to piggyback on that, I completely agree with what uh, Commissioner Matouche said. As someone who's a former planning commissioner, yes, of course, there's there's going to be blueprints, there's going to be specifics, but this is a planning framework, and you know we don't know what the economy will be like 12 months from now. Lots of things can change, lots of details can change, but I also agree, I'm looking at Commissioner Matouche, that this planning framework that we looked at, I say keep going forward with it uh, the way it is here. That's my personal suggestion regarding this, this, this process that we're on. Can uh, I ask a question? Sure. Or? Yeah. So what I'm hearing from some of my commissioner colleagues is that the financial analysis that was done by Dorn Bush and plan that's currently being implemented that they're comparing with each other and that the financial if a financial review of both of those were done or compared everything's hunky dory is that would that would you agree with that could you rephrase that that 
as, as has been said, that uh, what's being implemented and the, the financial analysis that was done on the project, that those, those two are coherent with each other and that there's no discrepancy and we can accept the Dornbush result as, as at face value. Well, I think the the fundamental, for me, the fundamental takeaway from Dornbush was get a 30-year agreement if you're going to do any ca major capital projects. And what we've got here is a not just a 35-year agreement if both uh, options are exercised, but also an exit pathway that has us being paid for the, the book value of anything if we're uh, um, leaving prior to that term or if there are still assets on the books at the end of that term that have not depreciated fully. And I think the idea behind that was to try to ensure that we didn't get to a point as the operator where we simply stopped maintaining it because there was not going to be time to get the return. There will be time to get the return if we, even if in, I, it may not be wise, but this is a 35 year agreement in, in year 33, if we don't sit down and, and figure out the next 10, 20, 30 years, um, would we stop making capital improvements? Well, we could continue to make uh, and operate a first-rate marina that serves the public if we know that we can make a significant capital improvement in year 25 and still uh, uh, recover that through the next 10 years of operating it and then the remainder of its capital life through um, uh, payment by the city because they would be then assuming that asset if we weren't there. Uh, the city has said they don't want to run a marina. If we weren't there, I would imagine they might get another third party company in and then they would become simply the pass through for the payment for that uh, capital asset. It, it, so I think we've actually gone beyond what Dornbush said. I'd just like to point out that when the city gets a third party to operate the marina, that okay. the city will have to pay for all the CIP projects and they'll also have to pay the operator of the marina because that's how it works in the real world. That's how it works at other marinas that are city owned that have management come in and take care of it. And that is exactly what we ought to be doing. You know. I don't see the benefit here, so that's why I've got to get back to this cost-benefit analysis. And I hear what you're saying about the numbers, but I haven't seen it in writing, so I can't wrap my head around a bunch of descriptions, pie-in-the-sky sort of descriptions about financials. I need to see the actual math and how it breaks down so that I can feel like I know what you're talking about, because I don't know what you're talking about, Steve. It, it's just right now numbers need to be in writing, not discussed um, because that's how we work with numbers. The thing okay. that separates us out in this instance from a private operator of a marina um, are the public functions that we uh, perform while we are at Oyster Point. I think it's worth remembering that um, we have uh, search and rescue functions there, that we cooperate, uh, engage in exercises with other public safety agencies. We were involved in one recently. Uh, uh, around uh, a, a, a theoretical incident out of SFO, uh, where we cooperated with uh, all of the Bay Area uh, public safety agencies, the Coast Guard, FBI, and so forth. So we've, we've got that fundamental public safety function. And I think uh, in our activity reports, you'll see our director of operations uh, on a regular basis will include stories of uh, how our search and rescue personnel have um, uh, saved lives on the bay. And I'm not sure you get to, I'm, I'm not sure how we would put a value on that or how we would, uh, how you can impart that to a public, a private entity. So to that, what I would say, Steve, is that at Pillar Point Harbor, that is a really legit argument that I completely agree with because there is no one else that can provide the type of service that we do as far as our 
emergency response is concerned, the Coast Guard, we know, cannot get to our location quickly um, at Pillar Point Harbor because of the way the geography is set up. So we are providing a really unique emergency response service to the public at Pillar Point Harbor. And the case for how critical that is from a countywide basis as well as a Bay Area basis, because we have users coming from literally all over the world at Pillar Point Harbor, y y you know, it's bulletproof. That is a very strong case that you can make at Pillar Point. You can't make the same case at Oyster Point Marina because the Coast Guard is nearby. You've got other, other uh, people that are offering that kind of service. The city themselves could offer that service. There's nothing stopping them from doing that. They could do it through their fire department, just like the Menlo Park Fire Protection District. We don't come up here, FYI. No, I know, I, I know. We don't come up here, but I will say this, and uh, to piggyback on what you said, Sabrina, water rescue is actually also a sheriff's function. So they, they can do that too at Pillar Point if needed. Um, but having talked to the Harbor Rescue staff, at Oyster Point, I think they're very unique in that they work hand in hand with the San Francisco International Airport and dealing with situations or incidents like the Ajiana crash when uh, the the plane what didn't even quite make it on the runway. So so and just to just I I, I don't think anything like that is unique even at Pillar Point because the sheriff's office has the same function. And to bring up um, an agency that has no jurisdiction this far north is totally um, can I, irrelevant, can and, I, and it's I not even saying, analogous. But so can I finish? Yeah, but Thank I you. just want you to know that the Menlo Park Fire Protection District Water Rescue does not come to South San Francisco. I, I thank you for sharing that. I do realize that, and I wasn't suggesting that well, they should. That's completely outside of your jurisdiction, yep. and they have absolutely no business covering this part that's of the right. bay. So I would completely agree with that. But my point is that in some cases, there are other agencies like that, the sheriff's office. such as sheriff, such as fire, that are providing emergency response services on the Bay, and Coast Guard clearly is one of those agencies. So all I'm pointing out is that there are a lot of opportunities for emergency response on the Bay. There are less opportunities, and I would agree with you that sheriff could sure. provide <coughs> emergency response, and they do some now at Pillar Point Harbor. I believe they keep a boat there. Um, you know, if you also look at the boats that we have for doing emergency response out of Oyster Point, it's not on the same level as Pillar Point. We can't do, even in Pillar Point, we have limited response. There's an area of service that we can cover, and then there's an area that we literally can't cover with the boats that we have, in which case you do have to wait for the Coast Guard to show up. And we haven't beef, beefed up our emergency response to a point where we can really cover a broader area. So our, we are fairly limited, but we're even more limited at Oyster Point because we have our better boats for rescue at Pillar Point for good reason, because that is a very dangerous area where there isn't good Coast Guard coverage. So it's a logical thing to provide better emergency response at Pillar Point, which is what we do. And we do more emergency response um, at Pillar Point than we do at Oyster Point. So that's a fact. Um, you know, I just think that it's not a good argument. That's, a, that's all I'm trying to say. Okay. I don't want to keep talking okay. about it because there's other things here that okay. I, you know, I'll like to go public comment in a few minutes. like to go over. I have some more questions. Um, thank you. So regarding, you know, I mentioned on the operational performance indicators, we need to know what those are in the list. Hopefully we can get that from Steve soon. I don't think we should have to wait what until the that? next meeting. So, yeah. so, okay. The operational performance indicators, yeah. which nobody says here what, what on earth those are. So we need to know, you know, what's the criteria there. Um, so with regard to... that 80 percent of occupancy um, like if we could get more information about how that data is going to be provided and what you know what like do we get a couple months warning if we fall outside of that 
you know, I don't need to know right now, but if we could get something explaining that in writing, what that plan or program is supposed to look like, I'd like to know the details of that. Um, because we know that we have had many, 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 many years where we've had low occupancy. What is our occupancy right now, by the way? 74. 78. 78. And what's this, what's the, um, is that the average in the Bay Area? Yes. Okay, so we're right about average right now. Yes. But if, you know, a big construction project continues, it could go down, you know. Yeah, that, was, that was one of my concerns as well, if I may. Uh, so we are not um, committing to uh, 78 or even an 80% uh, uh, occupancy level in this agreement. We're committing just to 80% of the average. the average. Yeah, I get that. Um, but again, if we could see a chart that explains that so we could see what that looks like, because I can look back through our historic occupancy data, and it would be kind of nice to see that data so that we could see what's, you know, what's our average been over like the past 10 years or whatever, and then we could get a better sense of where, what, what, you know, what's our target? Where do we want, where do we have to be to meet the terms of this agreement? I mean, I just need a little bit more clarity because this is pretty vague here. Um, so city pays district depreciation, depreciated value of assets. Uh, okay. Um, what does that mean exactly? Like, does that include the restroom facilities, the roads, the, what's all included in that? Uh, capital assets in which we invest generally don't include roads and parking lots, but do include buildings and structures. Uh, and we put dogs. different life cycle, lifespans on different capital assets. A dock might be 30 years, a building might be 30 to 50 years. And then we straight line depreciate from that full purchase price or asset value when new down to zero uh, at the end of that schedule. So that after 50% of its life, it's got 50% of its value. After 75% of its life, it's got 25% of its value. And it'll be annualized over the 30 years yeah. in terms of payment, yeah. is depreciation there, payment. Is there a, um, what, I just want to be sure that there isn't room for like a lawsuit over this, like if they think the depreciation is more than we think it is, like what, our, where's our, the standard? Our, our books are audited, there is a fixed asset depreciation schedule that we would go by. And so, I mean, uh, our finance department can generate a report that says uh, we paid this for this, this uh, asset in this year and uh, it's now got a book value of this. And so you said that if the, like say this agreement was that the city decided, because I've heard from city council members that they don't want to be, they don't want this agreement. Like I've been told that. And maybe well, they'll vote. If they don't vote. want this agreement, then maybe they'll the vote for it. Won't happen. Maybe they'll vote for it. I don't know because it seems like the city is is really inclined to want to have this free service that we provide and uh, all the CIP projects that we are giving away um, with public funds. But you know, I can't imagine why they wouldn't go for it. It seems like a really killer deal for the city and for the city council. Um, but, you know, maybe that's just blowing smoke, I don't know, but, uh, you know, if they decided to bail on this and terminate the agreement early or whatever, um, and we have put in fancy new docks, um, you said that we could take the docks with us. Is that part of the agreement? It, it could be an option. Uh, the better outcome would be that they simply pay us for the docks. Is that something that's already been determined in these discussions, or is yes, that the, that's, that's the what this depreciation thing is all about? That, that's part of the exit. I mean, it was important to the district that we not that we be um, feel safe and secure in investing in a facility. Um, if we know we're going to be there for thirty years, then the asset a dock depreciates, and we receive revenue from that dock. We want to know that we could similarly invest in 20 years with a level of confidence because we want to operate a first-class marina. We need to have that level of confidence 
that we're not going to end up walking away from an asset for which we paid a bunch of money. So that's what this whole issue is all about, that the city has agreed to, is the idea that if we do invest in a 30-year asset, 10 years before the end, and then we don't continue operating, that they owe us for two-thirds of that value of that asset. Well, what if, like, two years into the agreement, they have some new plan over there, and they decide that they want to terminate the agreement, and we just put in new docs, um, and they say, well, we don't want to pay you for 100% or 90% or whatever our well, value of a, the docs is. Yeah. There's a couple of protections against that. First off, we would have to be in default for them to decide to terminate the agreement two years in. There's no option for terminating the agreement other than non-renewal of term. Secondly, um, they could say, uh, yeah, we don't want to pay you, and then we would file suit against them. So that would result in a lawsuit? If they chose to do that, yes, because that would be a breach of contract. We would have a contract that says, if you're kicking us out, or if, well, first of all, they can't terminate the agreement two years in. There's not that option unless we're in default. What if we're in default? Then what happens? Well, let's not be in default. Well, that could happen. What if Why would okay, it happen? So, because the you so might have a new board and they might not want to be there. I, I'm going to, I'm going to be in um, default. I think right. we're getting a little bit off topic here, and I know Tom's been waiting to make a comment, and I want to, and I know that <coughs> there are public members who want to make a comment too. So, Tom, do you want to make your comment? <coughs> The point of this whole thing was to receive a report and provide direction. The direction that I would provide, <coughs> and I'll be willing to make a motion, that we simply follow uh, a motion that we follow the process that's underway right now and continue <coughs> at the same time, keep the board apprised of new developments. That's your motion? <coughs> that's my motion because we're getting Second. right now into. Uh, silly micromanaging and oh, uh, just driving things into the ground with details that are the beyond the scope of this board. Do not okay. personally <laughs> attack <laughs> me, I'm Tom. There is a motion. Do not personally <laughs> attack me. Five minute break, please. You are harassing. Follow the process that's underway right now and keep the board apprised of new developments. Yes. Perfect. And then Second. Second. Okay. Second. I have someone who wants to make a public <coughs> comment and who's been waiting very patiently. I appreciate that. Um, I'm Steffi Richardson. I'm a resident, taxpayer, <coughs> water agency director, former mayor in Brisbane. I have attended thousands of public meetings. I have never seen such a dysfunctioning meeting to have. The commissioners <coughs> directly attacking this general manager, the attorney, putting words on their mouth, the rest of them. Part of the reason I see here when questioned commissioners asking questions such as, what is the occupancy rate? I have not been in your commission. I don't get your <coughs> regular pa uh, packets every month or every time. Every one of those informations are available to you, particularly as a commissioner, on the website and so forth. So it clearly shows the individual is not informed, does not read the information, and is just throwing <coughs> mud. And uh, I, I, I say something like, um, <coughs> uh, I am, uh, you know, I'm very concerned when a commissioner goes directly, talks to the developer, or whatever, rather than allowing the commissioners to give direction to staff to bring the information. Every comment <coughs> that so far I heard from Ms. Brannon, Commissioner Brannon, and really reflects, unfortunately, how much the person is not really following or reading the material. Like last time when she came and grabbed the public packet, without, res you know, without any respect to public's information, and it's exactly the same thing that is happening over here. So, um, what really, uh, I'm really sad, the fact that, um, <coughs> I heard something like them against us. <coughs> I'm from North County. 
I have worked with city council in South San Francisco. They are extremely cooperative, they are knowledgeable, they are expert, they want to make sure that the residents, the taxpayers benefit for the entire county is beneficial to everybody, not just one group. If you don't like something, say you don't like it, bring proposal, bring stuff that could be helpful, rather than being destructive. What I hear here, lawsuit, 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 lawsuit. That is, you know, it just shows how uninformed and bitter the person could be that does not even talk about the issue that I came here to. So far, Mr. Ed came back and says, this is what I'd like to come back to the meeting. That's the purpose of this meeting. I'd like to thank you, the commissioner, the chair, the staff, bringing this kind of a meeting so public can be knowledgeable. So thank yes. you. Thanks. OK, um, any other? Yeah. Yes, um, Steve. Yeah, prior to uh, uh, voting on the motion, I do need to seek direction from this commission. A request, uh, and, and <coughs> let me say that um, the city and the district have been working together on this for um, quite a while, and uh, I think we've had some significant breakthroughs, especially the part about uh, the city willing to uh, pay for the depreciated value of our assets at the termination of the agreement. Um, there are still some uh, details to be worked out, and we are um, getting close to being able to bring a work product to uh, this commission that uh, we feel could uh, be of value to the, the district and the public it serves. It's a sensitive time in that negotiation and that discussion, and consequently, um, I feel that I would like to keep things fairly closely held. I've had a request from Commissioner Brain to, uh, for, for me to provide her with a copy of all iterations of any agreements, all uh, communications between uh, district staff and city staff, and all communications <coughs> between district council and, city, uh, and the city attorney. Um, first and foremost, uh, I think there's a significant time commitment in putting that uh, uh, information together. And uh, I think that, again, uh, given that this is a sort of a fairly critical point in these discussions with the city, I would uh, seek direction from the commission as to whether or not that is a task that the commission wants me to uh, embark upon. Uh, I would prefer not to do that. I think that that's, I think that that could, um, yeah, I would prefer not to do that. So and I would just add, these are not public records that are being sought. And, um, <laughs> but I will do whatever the commission desires. I have a question hold on, about hold that. Hold on, Robert has, a, has his hand up. So Robert? Mm -hmm. um, with what Mr. Miller just said and with what Mr. Gr uh, McGrath just said, I completely agree with the general manager and I, <clears throat> And I do not want to derail this process. I want this process to continue. So I completely agree with um, Mr. McGraw. Okay, Sabrina. Um, first of all, I think this says a whole lot about uh, the lack of transparency that we're dealing with in this situation. Very concerning to me. Secondly, um, I believe that what I've asked for, uh, probably for the most part, is a public record. Um, communication staff to staff is public record last time I checked so what about that is not public record um, if you would like to make your request as a public records act request I think the district is more than happy to respond to that I think there will be documents that are exempt under the public records act either because they are draft documents or they are <coughs> deliberative process documents or they might be uh, attorney-client privilege documents, those would be uh, categories that would fall, that would require some scrutiny if this were a, a request from a member of a public. Um, so, and, and, I, and I should, uh, you know, I, I want to serve the district to the best of my ability. My client is the district. Um, the law is 
not fully developed in this area, but I think it's generally true that commissioners have rights that go beyond members of the public to see district documents that are necessary for them to see for the for, uh, for them to carry out their duties as commissioners. Um, I think your general manager is in a very, very tough spot because he feels that it's not in the best interests of the district to share half-finished work. Uh, it's my personal view that that does not in any way demonstrate a lack of commitment to transparency, but more one of wanting to involve the policy board at the appropriate time when there are policy decisions that have been fully formed and fleshed out that the policy decision makers can actually react to rather than show half-finished work that might cause, you know, be susceptible to interpretations that were not even intended. So when the general manager asked me, do I need to provide these confidential records to Commissioner Brennan, my advice to him was to seek the general direction of the board and to do what the majority of the board wants him to do. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. So why don't we um, have, let's take a vote on that and then if there's no more discussion, if there's no more public comment, and then we can talk about the issue that the general manager has put on the table regarding, uh, and the general counsel have put on the table regarding um, access for board direction to an individual commissioner. I mean, right now that's not an issue until um, there's a further discussion. But um, let's, is there any other discussion on the current motion? Yes. Just, Ed, just yeah. for clarity. Okay. So I'm still interested in, in having an understanding of the, of the agreement you all are working on when it's done. And Before it's done. You, yeah. It's well, only yeah. done when you say it's well, done. Right, but when you guys have your draft <laughs> so that I can see it and understand it because I'm not going to, I will not, I'll abstain if I don't understand it and I need to sit with it, have a look at it and if it's possible it'd be great to have that comparison even though the work has started I'd like to see the comparison of what that draft represents, what, what, what you're planning on doing with respect to what we said we were going to do in the financial analysis of the Doran Bush report. I've got because if it's significantly I've got different, to it back to the Doran Bush report. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Is that okay. a cost benefit analysis? So um, I'm going to reread the Doran Bush report to find out how this might tie to that. Yeah. Okay. I'd like to know. That's, that was the direction you is that preferred, what, yeah. Is that what you were at? I, so you made a motion to proceed as yes. blah, blah. And to provide direction, <coughs> yeah. Am I seeing but that that's going to happen? Yes. Okay. Yeah. okay. And are we going to get more information on um, what the specifics are around unless caused by the district? Can we get that yes. in writing? Yeah, all, all will be in writing. Okay, so all that's... All will be in writing. And that's coming Everything. to us. OPI's um, uh, meaning of uh, subsidence, meaning of protection against sea level rise. Um, this is a high level look at the issues that we have been uh, addressing and, and grappling with. And uh, again, what we're trying to do is craft a document that is good for 35 years. Uh, uh, we can't anticipate every possible outcome. We're trying to do so in the best way we can, but also trying to build in some flexibility because conditions will uh, change. And what was this part about water quality? You didn't explain that. Water quality. It says resolve details around water quality. Right. Exactly how do we uh, uh, encapsulate in written form uh, the responsibilities of the city under its uh, environmental protection program and stormwater pollution prevention plan? Or which is often referred to as a SWIFI, um, how do we encapsulate in written form our responsibilities uh, regarding the action of tenants and uh, bilge water, for example, and how do we encapsulate in writing our responsibility as public stewards, regardless of who's at fault, because we are the people on the ground and because we are the people with ready access to absorb the pads and boom, to respond immediately to anything anyway and then figure out responsibility. So those are the things that we're looking at around uh, uh, water quality. 
So there's going to be detailed written language. That, that's precisely what we are. And we're going on. and we're going to see the information about how we're going to maintain 80% of average occupancy. We're going to get more detail about that and we're going to get more detail. I, I, I can't speak to exactly what that detail is. but That's easy I, to come right. up with. Well, if it were easy, we'd have been done by now. I think, John, don't you think that's pretty easy to come up with if you look at our occupancy over the last 10 years? I think we could easily provide our what our occupancy rate has been over the last 10 years. Um, <coughs> Think it, and I then think look what, at the averages. I think what we, you know, I think what we'd find is it would hover somewhere between 70 and 85 percent. Uh, I think that's realistic between 70 and 85 percent. But I don't think probably ever it would have gone below 80 percent of surrounding marinas. Well, and that's I just to, like to be sure to, about that. Understood. And it would also, though, in this agreement, and Steve, Stephen, correct me if I'm wrong, but the way I read it. It would have to remain at below 80% of the average marinas for a two year period. Okay. Good. The discussions about the parties have been both specific and general with regards to meeting the obligations. The specific with regards to the occupancy rate is what John just described. The, that uh, the problem begins when the occupancy rate is less than 80% of the mean average of all Bay Area marinas for eight consecutive quarters. But that's the beginning of a resolu dispute resolution process where the parties meet and confer to develop a plan to try and address the problem. That is not the end of the discussion. So it, the, my sense of the agreement of the discussions has been not how can we screw each other, but how can we work in procedures so that we can work cooperatively to anticipate and prevent problems from occurring before they get out of control, generally understanding that the existing Joint Powers Agreement drafted 1976, I want to say, is just inadequate in those kinds of cooperative discussions. So I don't know if that provides any comfort level, but that's the, been the tone of the discussions that I've been a part of. Well, the tone is always positive until things go wrong. I mean, that's the we thing. We call for the question. It's not like we haven't okay. There's been a had our legal problems. We certainly okay. have. Okay. <coughs> you were calling for the question? Calling for the question. Okay. That is not debatable, so let's do a roll call, please. <coughs> You remind me what you're roll calling. Is this on Tom's, the Tom's motion? Okay. Yeah. Do Can you restate the Could motion? It? Restate the motion yeah. to follow the process that's underway right now and keep the board apprised of new developments. Commissioner Lorenz. Aye. Commissioner Matouche. Aye. Commissioner Chancarelli. Aye. Commissioner Bernardo. Aye. Commissioner Brennan. No. Okay, the motion carries four ayes and one no. Um, and did you have something? Yeah, I have a motion regarding the other discussion that we were talking about earlier. Um, and I will look to uh, the one that we're talking about with regards to disclosure of documents and things. Um, and I'm looking specifically at Mr. Miller to correct me if this is not the proper language. But my motion is to not allow for the disclosure of any document or communications that are incomplete and or related to confidential matters such as property negotiations. Is that all encompassing enough? Um, I'll read it again. I, I don't know that. Um, I think your general manager is just looking for support as to whether he can control access to documents to commissioners. Well, can I, I'm going to put it in a different way because I don't think it's about control of documents. I think it's about not having this board micromanage and and um, be a destructive That's force it. for what has what the, what the process is and what I don't <coughs> want is for the board not to be together because I think that is right now kind of the case when um, we've got one of our commissioners talking independently to the developer who has zero really obligation to us their relationship is with the city I think I might be wrong and even talking independently to um, 
a, another council member, which, you know, I mean, I guess you can do it, but I think for something at, at this point, for, for us to be together at, on this, where we're not micromanaging the general manager, that is important to me. So I don't want to say it's a control issue. I think everyone, at least I know I am, very committed to transparency, but I'm also trying to be respectful to the staff who are really working hard to try to incorporate all of our feedback. So I, first of all, I want to thank you all for doing all of that. I know it's a tough job, and it's it's been very complicated, and this is a multi-year process, and we're finally at a time where, you know, we can say, yes, we like some more of these things, or no, we don't like some more, or we want more information like what you brought up. So that's that's what I, how I view this as not a control issue, but a micromanaging issue. So I don't know if you want to adjust your motion accordingly. What she said. No. I have some. Because no. it's related um, to what I, have, I said. I have some comments I'd like okay. to make. Hold on. But so we got to get the motion first. Motion? We have four minutes. You know, based on, based on my motion, what you just said and what Mr. Miller said, I mean, uh, my my motion is to allow uh, the, the, staff, the yeah. staff to make the decisions without interference or micromanagement by board members. Well, not decisions, to continue on the path of no, um, to continue with uh, working and negotiating with um, the city. But that's what they're doing yeah. already. It's, I think it, the, the, what's key here is interference and micromanagement from the board. I mean, they're doing that well, already. It's, but it's, it's uh, commissioners, okay. if I may interrupt for a second, yes. uh, the meeting is posted 7 to 9 o'clock. It's now 8.57. Yeah. Um, and uh, absent a motion to continue for another 10 minutes, um, I would appreciate a consensus of the board on whether or not I should uh, uh, spend the time uh, and the effort to gather the records requested by Commissioner Brennan. Uh, I think it's also worth noting that Commissioner Brennan did uh, and the board might want to take this into account. And, uh, Commissioner Brennan did. I just asked to make uh, a uh, hold on. I would like to have the Commissioner gentleman. Brennan did um, threaten to sue if uh, the records are not forthcoming. So if that influences your decision about whether or not to uh, direct me to provide this information, that would be helpful. Okay, Super. And I'd like to make my comments really Thank quickly. You. Yeah. So first of all, um, I have not asked for any. Um, of this documentation until, what was it, a week ago? Um, and the reason that I did is because we have not been provided with um, regular updates on what's going on with our staff and the negotiations. There has not been, um, there hasn't been a level of information that I would expect coming from the staff regarding what's been going on. And in addition to that, for me to understand what we're considering doing, and this is probably one of the most important decisions that this board will make, you know, for years to come, because this is a long-term relationship that we're considering, I need to fully understand it. And the only way I can fully understand it is by reading the information about what is happening. And this staff report is, Sorry, but this is really thin. This does not provide me with adequate information to make decisions. And I, as, a, as an elected board member representing the people of San Mateo County, I need adequate information to base decisions on. And so I've asked for supplemental information, which includes public records. Hey, Sabrina, hold on. It's 8.59. So I'd like to make a motion to extend the meeting for another 10 minutes to 9.10. Is there a second? Okay. Um, I'll just a uh, quick roll call and then you can continue, Sabrina. Commissioner Brennan. Aye. Commissioner Bernardo. Aye. Commissioner Jankarelli. Aye. Commissioner Matush. No. No. Commissioner Arenas. Aye. Okay, <coughs> so the motion carries to extend our meeting for another 10 minutes out to 9.10. So, Sabrina. Thank you. <clears throat> so, I just want to stress that the information that I've requested, which includes communications between our staff and the staff of South City, which anyone can request via public record request and should be provided via the Public Records Act, um, it, there's nothing unreasonable about that request and I made it because I want to understand 
what I'm doing here. In order for me to make informed decisions, I need to have adequate information, and adequate information has not been provided by our staff. And with regard to any um, legal agreements that are getting hashed out, when I asked for the documents, and these were a variety of complete and incomplete draft documents, non-draft documents on our agreement with cartel management, a group that went bankrupt, um, I discovered that there were some significant mistakes made. And those all came out in the press, in the media, and we got ourselves into quite the costly situation where we had to hire a bankruptcy attorney, all kinds of expensive stuff happened that could have been avoided, and I learned from that that it's really important to understand what is going on with legal agreements. And the only way for me to do that and to be an informed commissioner and make informed decisions is to have adequate information. So I've asked not to have those documents sent to me or somehow provided to me outside of the district. I've asked to come in to either council's office, and that would be Hanson Bridget, or to the Harbor District office when it's convenient for the staff for our, our legal uh, person and review it. I don't care if it's in print or on a computer. It doesn't make any difference to me, but I would like to read it. I'd like to understand how this negotiation is going because I only just learned tonight that we apparently um, attempted to set up a management agreement where we get paid for the services we provide, which is what I think the public expects, and in addition, we don't put the bill for CIP projects for a city that owns the facilities. The city <coughs> owns all the land at Oyster Point. We own none of it. So this is a very reasonable request. This is a, a really important time for our district. This is an important negotiation. And I'm sorry, but this little thin staff report and PowerPoint presentation that the public didn't get to see tonight because you know, we had some technical difficulties isn't enough. I need more information to make an informed decision. And legally, as an elected commissioner, I am allowed to view those documents. And no one, not this board, not our legal counsel, not the general manager can stop me from seeing that information. It's the only way you can protect the district against fraud. If you stop allowing the elected officials to read the documents, that is how fraud happens. And I was just at the California Special District Association where we, uh, um, annual meeting, where we learn about how to stop fraud. And if you block the elected officials from looking at documents that are about contract negotiations or whatever, it doesn't matter, then you open the door to fraud and you are basically stopping me from doing my duty as an elected representative of this district. So I'm not asking for too much, I'm asking for information that will help me make an informed decision and so no one here, you can vote to block me from doing it if you want, but you don't legally have the right to do that. You can't stop me from viewing that information and I intend to make sure that I do my due diligence and, my, and I take my responsibility seriously as an elected representative of the citizens of our county and I need to view that information to do my job and, and no one here can stop me from doing that job. So I'm going to make a comment. Thank you. I agree that we have to do our due diligence. We've had numerous reports, the Dornbush reports, we've had status updates. So I think we've had plenty of information that's been in the public realm at our public meetings. I can't help it if, you, if people don't understand certain things, but I know that we've asked questions of this staff, and I remember the conversation about the Dornbush report, which took up the majority of our meeting. They were very good about answering our questions. We did have a meeting where the management agreement issue was brought up, and I can't remember, I think it was either June, July. July, somewhere in that time frame. And so maybe at the next meeting, bring back that, that part of the report unless you have it now. But I think that over at least the years I've been on this commission, which is just under three years, we've had plenty of good information. 
I've read it. It's on our website. Per your request, Sabrina, it's been it's all put on the website. Whether it's linked, they're going to add the links to that. Um, Ed asked a great question. I, they're going to look into that. So the information's been out there and it's been discussed in the public realm. And I view because this board and I and I say this with all detachment as much as possible. From what I've seen, there's been a lot of interference from the August 2017 Oyster Point Joint Liaison Committee meeting uh, where we had to break a quorum so that there wouldn't be a Brown Act violation. To there was not it, a Brown uh, Act violation. I'm not done, and yes, there I'm, could have been had there been a quorum. I'm so please stop. Misinformation. You're not. You're, that's your interpretation. I'm correcting the, the misinformation. District, the district attorney I'm has already said. I let you talk. I'm correcting I misinformation. let you talk. So I'm correcting misinformation. I would like the board to give a consensus so that the general manager can continue working. There's no decision that's going to be made until it's done. And then we, we've asked the questions. You've, you're going to get what you want, Ed. You're going to get what you want, Sabrina. That's the purpose of this meeting, Robert. I thought I had a motion. Well, you, I don't know. Did you have a motion? Do you want to read? I, I thought I had a motion before okay. all of this went Sorry. Happened. Why don't you restate it? Okay. My motion is. You might have to modify it in light of the. We'll just like read what you have. I'm going to go with my original. To not allow for the disclosure of any document or communications that are incomplete and or are related to confidential matters such as property negotiations. That's my original motion. <coughs> Second. Okay. Um, Ed, do you want to say anything? Because you're the only yeah, one who hasn't said anything. That, that motion makes no sense. I'm sorry. Maybe our attorney can can add some. You mean with South San you, Francisco? I think you understand his intent. Maybe you could say it in a way that makes sense. I think that make any if sense. I can help him, we can step back from making a motion. Okay. I s seem to be hearing so not unanimity by a long shot, but at least a consensus that the board does not want the general manager to interrupt the flow of current negotiations by uh, uh, sharing any uh, uh, incomplete work product or communications uh, and does not want the general manager to spend time on that at this point in time. If that is the consensus of the, uh, if that is the sense of at least a majority of the board, then I have my marching orders and we don't need to struggle with the wording of a motion. Okay. Ed, how do you feel about that? We have two minutes and we're going to be adjourned. A minute and a half. Okay. I would say I'm, I'm not in complete agreement with it, so I would say no. Okay. Tom? I'm in favor of it. Robert? I'm in favor of it. Serena? Obviously I'm not in favor Okay. Of it. I'm in favor of it, so you have your consensus. It is 9.09. .09. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Commissioner Brown. Aye. Commissioner Bernardo. Aye. Commissioner Chancarelli. Aye. Commissioner Matouche. Aye. Commissioner Lorenas. Yes. Motion carries. The meeting is adjourned. Are you going to be in tomorrow, Steve? Okay. Um, no.